Good evening and welcome to the Gina Mui Guy Show. Uh, today is Thursday where I get to bring you guys a nice guest who is going to inspire you and help us achieve our major goals. Tonight we are going to be having Dr. Nathan Okioga all the way from Kenya. He grew up with a lot of challenges but then he never gave up on his dream and his career and currently he holds a very good lucrative career here in America and he will be telling us about his journey, how he got to the point where he is and so I am very excited to bring him over tonight. Uh, as we wait for others to join in, thank you for those who are already here. Feel free to go ahead and share and tag other people. Let other people know that you are um, uh, to know that we are live and they can come join us. And so if Nathan you are here, I will be looking for you and I'm going to be adding you in a short while. For those who are joining us for the first time, welcome to the Gina Mui Guy Show. This is where you come to get inspiration, to get your ideas, to get your uh, to get your tools and resources to be able to achieve all of your career, uh, your goals, um, your ambitions, your dreams, and all of that. So welcome, and Nathan, I am waiting for you so that I can add you and we can go ahead and get this interview rolling. So tonight we have a guest who is an inspirational achiever in the career. Uh, we bring guests who, who talk about businesses, those who have done pretty well in their businesses, in other aspects of life. But tonight we are having someone who have done pretty well in their career, despite uh, all odds, a lot of things that they had to overcome. And so I will be adding Dr. Nathan uh, in a minute. So Nathan, if you are here, if you can see me, just, just type something on the comments and I will be able to see that. And then I can, okay, um, all right, I'm going to approve your request and I'm going to add you up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing good, yourself? I am doing good. Yeah, awesome. Um, can you hear me with the headphones or? Yeah, we can hear you. We will get that from the audience. So you can keep your headphones on. Um, and are you guys able to hear uh, me and Nathan clearly? We just want to be sure. And Nathan, you're like half the camera. Half the camera, I know, right? So let me <laughs> shift it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. how about that? Yeah, that's a good position. Okay. okay, so if everybody can hear us clearly, please hit the thumbs up so we can know that we are together and we are all on the same page. Uh, and so, Dr. Nathan, very much welcome to the Gina Mui Guy Show. I'm happy to have you here today. Okay. Thank you and, so much. And um, you're welcome. Yeah, so today we will be talking about uh, the career. We want to uh, let people learn your journey and maybe you want to walk us through your career journey so that we can be inspired to know that it might not be easy, but then it can be done. Okay. Right. I see people saying that we are clear, loud and clear. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So, uh, Dr. Nathan, we're going to go ahead and get started. I will let you introduce yourself and tell us something about yourself, where you come from, and um, anything you want to share as we get started. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, first of all, for having me in, in this platform. And I don't take it kindly. I mean, it's uh, uh, lightly, I mean, it's really a great honor to have here. And not only that uh, for me to talk about myself more so, but to inspire somebody out there who's probably thinking, of not um, doing what their dreams are. So in brief, my name is Nathan Okioga. I was born in Kenya in a place called Kisi in Nyaura. And that's a, a few miles from Kisi town because that's where most people do know, those who know Kenya a little bit. And then uh, I came to the U.S. in 2005. Man, I, don't, I can't believe it's been that long. So, so you get to a point where I don't, I don't count anymore because, you know, once you get busy and other stuff, sometimes time catches up with you. Yeah, basically, that's who I am. And uh, we'll talk more about my background as you go down uh, mm -hmm. with time. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And were you able to share the show with your audience? I knew there were people waiting for you from your platform. Yes, I did. I did. And there's some oh. people already looking up and friend requesting a lot of stuff. Okay. So, yeah. 
Okay, so that is good. Okay, so yeah, we are going to go ahead and uh, get started by you telling us, um, maybe walk us a little bit about your background, because you mentioned about background, and it's very important to know where we are coming from so that we can be able to figure out how to get where we're going. Um, and yeah, I did learn about the obstacles that you had to overcome, especially from Dr. Yoga's, uh, you know, inspiration. So I want you to tell the audience a little bit about your background, how you grew up. Yeah, basically, I was born in uh, Nairobi. My dad got married to my mom and then he moved to the city, which was uh, typical back in the day. And in most cases, mm -hmm. most husbands used to leave their wives at home and then go to the city, work, and then send money home to support their families. Uh, however, my dad decided to go with my mom, and then as they started life together, you know, raising this young family, unfortunately, he comes to pneumonia and he died in, back mm -hmm. in the 1980s, uh, leaving my mom with uh, two kids and another one. She was pregnant with the third one when he died. Yeah. And then we ended up, yeah, we used to live in Huruma estate. I think, you know, when I put the names to places, some people can be able to relate and they probably can be able to put the picture together. So I may mention a few names mm -hmm. here and there for those people who are looking who are watching from uh, Kenya. So at least they can see yeah, the background. Yeah, but most people it. are not even Kenyan, so you're okay, you can skip it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, then uh, we ended up back in the village. And uh, as you can see the picture which you posted comparing then and now, uh, we ended up in a grass-touched house. My dad had not built a house back there in, Afri in Kenya, I mean in the village. So we ended up in a very old okay. house that uh, was grass-touched and sometimes it would rain at night. And we spent sometimes, during rainy night, we spent more time moving, trying to find a corner that wasn't drizzling from the, the roof. Mm -hmm. To get a little uh, sleep. <laughs> I know it was, but you know, at the end of the day, is uh, as I look back to it, I have come to in terms with it, because later on, as we learn, as you, we talk more about me, we will figure out that it all worked for good, and everything was set up for a purpose. So yeah, we, we yeah, moved back there. Yeah, so I then I joined Kisi Primary School. That's where I started my uh, early education. And then I'll walk about uh, four miles to, to school in the morning. So I leave home around six to be able to get there at uh, 8.30 in the morning. And along the wow. way, we had a, a few of my friends who were from the village together. So we walk together in the morning. Once in a while, mm -hmm. we catch a ride with one of our neighbors who had a, a taxi a truck that they used to carry uh, stuff for people in, in, the, mm -hmm. in the city. Yeah, then it got worse from there, basically to kind of... Uh, Fast forward a little bit, my mom couldn't keep a job in the, uh, in the city. She also moved back in the village. So that's how we hmm. ended up living there. Back, but before she came back in the village, we were living with my grandma. So she will, she, cause she had a little job back in Nairobi. So we lived oh. with my grandma and she would take care of us. But the walk back and forth was kind of taking a toll on me uh, for a while. And right. I couldn't afford school fees for the most part. And at one point, I remember... I was termed as the dirtiest boy in school because I didn't have a, a uniform uh, that was clean that I could rotate between the clean and dirty uniform. So whatever I wore the previous day, if I got home, if I didn't get home on time to wash it and get it dry for the following day, I have to wear it the way it was. Or if it rained uh, on my way home and I couldn't be able to wash it. So at one point, uh, one of the headmasters there, you know, he pulled me out of the crowd and yeah, it was it was terrible. But then. After that, it is, it is. But he didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, the more I went to school, and I couldn't afford school fees for the most part. And the way they did back then, they held your report from back. So you will go through classes, but when, at the end of the semester or the trimester, you will not get your report card. So they will hold it back until you pay the school fees. So for the most part, I never really got my report form. I did get my papers back to show how, to show how I did in terms of... Uh, the grades, but I never got my overall grade to know which position I was in class, whether I was the last one, the first one, or the third one. And, so, and at this point, were you doing well in class? Were you passing your exams? I did. I, every day? Correct. I, I, was doing, I was doing well. And the reason being that it so happened that the teacher was teaching the class, kind of knew my parents and they knew my background. So whenever the teacher came in class to say, hey, I'm sending the following people to to, I mean, to go home and bring school fees, she would hide me behind the teacher's cupboard. You know, they used to have back in the cupboard where they put their books and uh, teaching materials. 
so she will hide me there or some and the other kids will see that they will know that you know Nathan is here but the teacher is just covering for for him saying that he's not here or if let's say it starts from the first class but before it gets to us my teacher will be like hey run to the toilet by the time you come back you'll have gone and then i'll continue so the classes the struggles and just was coming through for you correct correct and you see yeah, and as far as giving me the report form she couldn't do anything about that because the teacher i mean the head teacher was in charge of that and he had to make sure that no, whoever didn't pay school fees did not get the report cards so mm -hmm. and then yep then my mom came back life was so hard go ahead mm -hmm. you have a question and then no, go she ahead. Did... So she was in the city and then came back now to the village correct to try and take care of mm -hmm. us now but it, life is so difficult she became a house help so she was a house help in a place we call Milimani Flats that's uh, one of the houses in uh, by Kisi town where she was so what will happen is i will go to class in the morning i'll finish i'll pass by where she was a house help she will give me some of the food that they had cooked and eaten and uh, any leftovers to carry over to my siblings back in at home and that's what we will eat and then until the following day when uh, if i was lucky to get to breakfast then i will head back down to the city go to class pick up go back again pick up some food and head back which she did for a while until the the client whom she was uh, doing house help with died and she lost mm. that then that no. resolved into something she became now she, uh, now she was unemployed she, without food she borrowed money and she, she started selling uh, sugar cane in a place we call mbetayari so that's where she would sell sugar cane and then head home uh, back in the evening at least we, the good thing about that though is that we had her at home different the fact that in the morning she will go sell sugar cane go to uh, buy sugar cane supply come and sell it and in the evening we were at home together that's the only good thing that came out of uh, being a house help and then uh, mm -hmm. she couldn't keep up with that so what happened is as life got difficult we were kind of given out adopted by other uh, grandparents or family members who thought like my mom was helpless to raise our, our three kids and but before that she had gotten a fourth kid because she got remarried to my to my uh, uncle who was the second born who my father my father was the first born <laughs> <laughs> like your uncle or just a stepdad from outside of the family from the from within the family you know back then we had wife inheritance and it was still a practice which was uh, still practiced back then and so mm. Yeah, he, he he started raising us as his own kids, but that only lasted for a short time. So we and mm -hmm. in that process, our fourth born was born in 1993, and that's how we ended up being four kids. You know, my dad died when I was two. We were two. Uh, the third one was right. my mom was pregnant, and then the fourth one. So yeah, then what happened is okay. my grand some of the grandparents adopted my two sisters, and then for me I was left at home because at least I was going to school. The other ones were a little bit younger. so at least my mom mm -hmm. could find time to go to the market and sell some sugar cane and some if they are out of season avocados and she, and yeah we'll talk about that and how I came to help later on as, as the years went by yeah okay. so then uh, i got a break uh, one day my mom left so that business didn't work well then she also became another she got another job as a house help again <laughs> to help her cousin with her farm work so on that day what happened in those occasions now we will i will come from school i will get home then i'll go from home on fridays meet a halfway in a in a in a school we call upridge is in Ke in kisi between kisi and uh, kilgoris so we will meet there and she will give me the food on fridays to go back and that will last us for about a week the food that she had earned by working over there for those uh, few days that she was there so because i was the only one and uh, her sister who had come to help me because i was still young and as that was going my grandmother my grandmother passed on so that's how her sister came over to help us um wow is this the point where you were saying that you kind of had to to choose one meal to skip because having two or three meals in a day was a luxury that you guys could not even afford correct and remember the first mm -hmm. the first one in the morning if i was lucky i'll get something left over which we had to fight over with the uh, with the mice at night you know you either sleeping or you're trying to chase the mice away that are trying to eat the whatever food left over you have for the following morning i mean it was it was life i mean that was what it is but then the lunch time i was at school so that one sometimes i skipped mm -hmm. that because either way i couldn't make it on time to have that and then dinner if we were lucky we will get mm -hmm. we will get the food and mm -hmm. i never knew people could boil wheat 
but at some point that's what that's what it came down to boiling wheat like rice and we boil it in yeah. yeah wow yeah. okay and, they, and yeah. so at this point now uh, how are you coping with working to school for miles is that kind of a lot at the same time you're, it, you're hungry and you have to keep up with school how did it all work it worked out because god you know worked in a miraculous way that one of the persons that i was going to school with was uh, one of the kids i was going to school with their father used to teach in that school kissy primary so he, he, whenever i give them lunch he will he will also include me in the, in the mix so i'll get some bite okay. here and there to eat and we call, you know in kenya between class 1 uh, and class 3 you don't have afternoon classes so the classes will only last up to 12:30 and then from there you are released and you head home and if you had a friend who had a sugar cane or who was willing to share something with you they will share with you and believe me it, it may look like it's exaggerated but this is the fact that at some point i had to eat sugar cane leftovers you know some of those ladies when they sell sugar cane towards the end of the sugar cane they don't sell that part but uh, that's what i could resolve into to just uh, fill my stomach uh, to head home that's until i became mm-hmm. a business person i started doing some business on the side and which i can talk about later yeah. to raise okay. some money for that then I, so yeah. up to what grade did you have to do this like, i i, I did that i did that up to third grade and then one day i was uh, eating sugar cane when my one of my uncles the one i told you had remarried to my mom who became abusive and they couldn't live together anymore so they had gone separate ways uh he found me in a bla- in a place we call uh black house it, black house is a, like it's basically is like a an apartment flats which people used to refer if you wanted to meet somebody there they say hey let's meet at black house because of the color it was painted mm-hmm. he he beat me in the middle mm-hmm. of the street thinking that i'd stolen the sugar cane and at that point uh one of my un- my aunt or my grandmother used to live behind what i call gudka and she she had told me over time like hey whenever you come just do what pass by my house get something to eat before you head home after she graduated from nyancho nyancho college became a teacher then she got married to her husband who used to live in kisi town so that's how i got kind of break and, and that's back in when i was in third grade so he beat me so bad and with all the abuse uh, after he let me go home i didn't go home i turned back and went back to my grandmother and said i can't go back home i can't stand the abuse anymore and that's when she took me in and i said commuting now and now the commute came from 4 miles to about a mile and a half from there so we, at this mm-hmm. point you are the one who is making a decision to walk away from the beef <laughs> yes <laughs> i know i, I cuz it, it it was terrible first of all i was hungry carrying the books which i had to carry in a, a, bo- a box that we used to carry and going home and you know all that time taking one and a half hours two hours to get home it was just too much for me to take so i headed nice. back there she's mm-hmm. and so you went all the way to class 8 no I I didn't mm-hmm. then I got a break so when there uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh her brother who was in the US came to visit and they found okay. me I, ironing my shirt in the morning I had you remember I didn't have so many uniforms as I said to rotate it back and forth so one night I watched it didn't dry so I was ironing it in the morning and he was like hey wait a second why why are you ironing your sh- your school shirt I said you know I don't have anything to wear this is the only thing I have and it's not dry I have to get it dry so that I can wear it to school Uh, mm. and he's like oh no that's not good uh, how are you doing in school i said i don't i do well i have my you know my papers but i don't have my report card to know which position i am then he made a mm-hmm. promise mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and he made a promise he said if you become number one, the whole i'm going to pay all the tuition that is uh, back dated so you can get your report form so i can see how you're performing so he did that so he cleared all the arrears and i was able given the report forms so he looked at it and said okay if you're going to be number one, for a whole year in, in your class mm-hmm. i'm going to take you to boarding school and that was on mm-hmm. fourth grade so i worked hard on fourth grade and fifth grade and then uh, after that you know i got a break and there's a lot that go went in between there so mm-hmm. and so from I, fourth grade you went to boarding school i then i went to boarding school from sixth grade because mm-hmm. fifth grade the, the mm-hmm. my aunt was adopting me their husband got laid off 
and he had to leave the company home. So they bought a land and they left. So I had to go back to the home that I was running away from. And wow. Back to the same life. Uh-huh. Yeah. And wow. at that point, that's when I, I started going back and forth. Now I started selling uh, aluminum tins, you know, to the people in Joakali or the people in the industry who make all these things. Because in fourth grade, you, don't, you have afternoon classes. Back one to third grade, you go home after two of thirty. One, to, I mean, fourth grade all the way to eighth grade, you didn't have to go home. You had evening class until four thirty. So oh, wow. on my lunch, on my lunch break, uh, I will spend on fourth grade. I will spend send, selling those things. So I'll go to the gas stations, like Toto gas stations, and uh, some of these, and buy, take all those Nescafe, Milo, and all the other stuff, and then go sell them in a place called Saint Jude. I don't know. It's a Jude is still there. It's a, it's a small uh, supermarket. So, isn't that the same thing that street boys do? Correct, correct, do? correct, correct. Wow. Yep. So I was competing with I was competing with street kids on selling mm. that, and with time, wow. I, I became kind of trouble kid. So this way it gets sad. I will sell those tins, and then the supplies start running low, as they start transforming from tins to plastic. And then I will sell the whatever I have uh, in the morning. And then at night, I will go back and steal them and go back and sell to those guys the following day. Oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, I had to do what I had to do. And, you know, it's it's not what I'm proud of. And mm-hmm. the little money I made out of that on, on weekends, I spent going to movies. So instead of mm-hmm. going to church, we used to go to Kissy Center, SDA church. So mm-hmm. I will go to church, know he's preaching, then escape. Uh, back and go watch mm-hmm. movies. That's when the wow. rambo and all the other stuff were coming out. Anyway, so... so uh, and call whoever paid, uh, cleared your arrears in the balance. Now he is ready to take you to high school, like a boarding school. Correct. In, um, in okay. Erong. Yeah. How did you perform in the boarding school? How was, it, was the transition for you? Uh, the transition was hard, but at least I had meals. You know, that's, that, that's the best part of it. I had breakfast, lunch, and supper. Although it was made of weevils and all... Uh, you know, kale, which is boiled and the stuff, and cabbage. And once in a while, if you're lucky, you get some beans. But mm-hmm. I had food. But then mm-hmm. that is from sixth grade, six, seven, and eight. I did that. But during those times, I continued with my business thing. I never carried, I never took shopping to school. Uh, I, instead, I filled my bag with avocados. And the avocado will go at a very high price, especially, you know, with bad meals. People will want to put avocado in their meal. So what I'll do is I will sell those, avoc- I'll get them ripe, then I'll sell them. And then the way I got my soap and other supplies is because I went around the field picking up those ones that the kids were living outside. So some kids were very wealthy from Nairobi. They will come to the village and they don't care. They will wash their clothes, they leave the soap there. That's what I will use to to take care wow. of my needs. Yeah, I see. So, and now at high school, how was the high school? Did you go to a Yes, so I did well. My principal, my head, head teacher loved me so much with how much I performed. I used to be a very bad noise maker. I used to sit in back of the class with some of my friends. And for sixth, seventh, I was terrible. I was known as the most notorious guy in, in school. Every time my teacher would say, I'll beat you, he'll say, I'll beat you, Asko Kyoga. You know, I became a reference point because of how much whipping I, I did get because of the the kind of stuff I'd gone through and stuff like that. But on the eighth mm-hmm. grade, the teacher made me a promise and he said, if you do well, I'm going to give you 15000 for your shopping to go to a national school, if you make it to a national school. So I, on eighth grade, I, did, I was one of the most improved guy in the school, from just using a pass mark to just getting back in the front of the seat uh, with one of my mm-hmm. co- classmates who later mm-hmm. became also a doctor. And yeah, I, I performed extremely well. They were able to sponsor me. I went, and that one also didn't transition easily. I couldn't afford going, so I got to admit to national school, Nairobi school, and I couldn't afford it. So we went to the Kisi, Kisi town location where I was from. We asked the chief there to sign me what you call a, a note to have a performer. A performer is a, basically a, a something you use to collect money. So you go around asking people, soliciting people money, saying, hey, you see, these are my grades. So behind the performer, I have my grades, and then I have the performer. So I'll be here like, hey, this is my grades. This is my admission letter to Nairobi school. I can't afford it. Are you able to sponsor me, you know, get me a little money to even get shopping to go back? 
uh, to score uh, to to Nairobi's goal. And the people at this point are wondering what happened to the uncle who sponsored me to go to the or my my relative who sponsored me to go to the boarding school in the first place. At this point in really? time, uh, mm-hmm. we were not very in good, really in good terms, and he had a lot of burden to carry okay. over. And so they had mm-hmm. told me instead of going to Nairobi school, I should choose a cheaper school around which, the local area. Correct, which I refused. Oh. Mm. Yeah, and that's when one of my uncles said, "No, no, 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 you can't do that." Then he, he took my in, that performer and my performance. He went all the way to Nairobi to his friends, and he said, "This guy has to go to his school. You guys have to to make sure that he did." And that's when they invited me, and the school gave me fifteen thousand for shopping. So I, I was. And able so to you were able to go to the Nairobi school. Correct, and where I did. Okay. Uh, the, yep. and- how did you end up in America and how did you end up choosing FAMD because it's one of the very high degrees, it's lucrative, it's good, but it's not easy. It's not an easy program. How did you end up going through that? I I was able to come in and then uh, I, I did well in Nairobi school. I graduated. I had an A minus. I was going to university. So I came to US through a green card. I was lucky. I had only like 100 shillings left in my pocket after graduating. And then mm-hmm. I applied for it, and I was lucky to get one. So I came, and then I, I was welcomed. It was so difficult transitioning in the U.S. So I quickly, okay. you know, I had to choose. I started doing nursing assistant and uh, other, other things on the side, working two jobs to, to try and figure out. And that's why I had to choose between helping my family back home who are very poor and then me also creating a future for myself. And mm-hmm. I ended. Up, I, I I chose to go to college as well as work another job to to be able to support my siblings who are now back at home going to to school. And I ended up doing that. Then I graduated, went to Missouri, worked there for a while, and then continued uh, supporting my mom. At least at this point, I could be able to chip in a little bit more. And after that, um, when my kids were all, gra- my siblings were graduated, my youngest brother and my sister, my other sister had already died. I didn't tell you that part because it, the adults, mm. this session would be very long. Wow. So she died when I was only second grade. Yeah. So my sister and my brother graduated. Then I said, you know what? I can go back and pursue my career in Farm D because that's what I always wanted mm. to do. Yeah. But even in school, the mm-hmm. undergraduate wasn't easy. I had to change a career. Mm-hmm. I had to change my major uh, a few times. And I think you, the, the, the sad part, we don't have the programs like this one where you have right now. You didn't have the platform which you have right now. And I thank you for what you're doing, you know, sincerely. Because some of us are very misinformed. You know, like right now, people who listen mm-hmm. to you can kind of get an idea on which direction to take. Some of us didn't have a sense mm-hmm. of direction when you came to this country. Uh, live alone trying to adjust me calling 911 because my car was towed i didn't know that that's not an emergency in the u.s but to me it was an emergency not knowing which food to order which food to eat and you know i ended up in farm d mm. and that's what i i started doing and that's after marrying and i never gave my wife a honeymoon i i married and went to school straight <laughs> i know <laughs> So, and how how did you end up in FAMD? Because it's not an easy program. You know, I work with people every day trying to help them get admissions to you know, these programs, elite schools, and all of that. Mm-hmm. But I find that a lot of people are not even half prepared of what they need to do for them to get into these programs, and they think it's really hard. While well, it's them who are not well prepared. How was it for you? And what can you tell someone who who really would love to pursue a career like FAMD? What I'll tell people is that, first of all, it's not uh, easy. That's number one. Number two is undergraduate, I always encourage everybody to do. Uh, graduate school, like FAMD program, is a choice. And th- that choice is a choice that, you know, you're going to be living with for four years of tough work, a lot of work, and you can't go back once you start it. So mm-hmm. I ended up in mm-hmm. there. I, I started uh, choosing, when I was in Kenya, I wa- really wanted to do FAMD at some point. And when I came okay. here, I was like, yeah, I, I will do that. So what I did is when I was doing my undergraduate, I was looking through which classes I was needed to prepare for to get to farm D program. And then I'll take mm. those alongside with my major. And granted, right. some of them were so hard. And this is the, the tr- part of it is that it's, I had a D plus in my calculus first attempt. So uh, the reason I'm telling you this is not that uh, the D plus people go to farm D. 
that you can go to school and just get D's and expect to, to go to pharmacy school. But what I'm saying is that you're going to fail. And that is part of going to school. I, I get a D plus, my GPA took in the opposite direction. At one point, I had like a 1.8 GPA and people can be like, how did you pull through that? I, I quit Facebook. Wow. I'll tell you that. I quit Facebook completely. And I took extra summer classes. I had to retake those classes uh, because I always had to do them to be able to make it to pharmacy school. Mm -hmm. So I, after doing all those classes and graduating from undergrad, then I started preparing for farm class or uh, pharmacy admission test which I did mm -hmm. when I was, I was still working. And that took a lot of discipline. So that's number three. It takes a lot of discipline. I, I tell you that. Because the number mm -hmm. four, it needs a lot of finance. Because every school, you have to apply. There's application fee. So anyway, to sum it up, you have to be self-motivated and you have to know this is what you want. And that's what I mm -hmm. tell everybody who comes to ask me for what, what is it, it entails to go to FAMD or any medical right. program, or any program. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. It's just you mm -hmm. have to know that this is what I want and go with it with everything you got. Cause yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, my journey in FAMD wasn't easy either. So. Mm -hmm. How, yeah, you mentioned about things you had to overcome, like for going your honeymoon for days. Yeah. Um, and for the viewers who are here with us, um, I can read a comment or two. Uh, uh, so Verena is saying what an encouraging story. Thank you for sharing my brother. Thank you. And then we have Mike Mogoy went to school with this guy, two classes ahead of me. There's a classmate of you who oh, is thank you, Mike. Likes on Wapi. Awesome, mm -hmm. my brother. All right, you guys, please hit the thumbs up or say something to Nathan to encourage him because it's people like him who just come here to encourage other people who are kind of giving up and drowning uh, to just keep going. So just write something to encourage Nathan, hit a thumbs up and show him the love and support and appreciating him to open up with us. And so, Nathan, um, what obstacle did you have to overcome when in from D school? And number two, uh, we see that mostly people from our background, like Africans, we do have kind of a mindset when it comes to pursuing some careers or doing some stuff that are outside of our comfort zone. What mindset mindset do you think we should fix before we can even think of pursuing careers like that? Yeah. First of all, uh, one of the mindsets you have to have is that uh, in this world, it's only you. You are created one you. Uh, and that's number one. Number two is every day you wake up, just imagine two things. One, like the same way a gazelle and a lion wakes up in the morning. A gazelle has one option, not to be eaten. A lion right. has another option, it has to eat. So has two things eat. can drive you. One, inspiration and desperation. If you are, you know, it depends. For me, both of them had to really... B, if you have a mindset that your inspiration is your dead sentence, or I mean your desperation is your dead sentence, you can't make it, then you are not gonna, even if you have inspiration, you're not gonna do it. The other thing mm. is, if you are, when if you are inspired and you get you meet a, a desperation challenge along the way and you don't know how to handle it, you can't do it. So, have that mindset that you know what challenges are only for a short time, and mm. in this world, it's a competitive world. If I have to do this, I have to survive. Second thing is choose between what is important and what is urgent. That is always tell people, especially from our background. We, we have the option, oh, do I want to invest in Africa and go back? Or do I want to invest in myself and my future? And that's, why they, that's another big challenge that I had to overcome, especially some of my colleagues were like, man, you come from a very poor background. Why are you wasting time going to pharmacy school and all this stuff when you could just invest your time? You're here on a green card and you can do what you can uh, invest back in Kenya. And, I, you know, I was like, it's so sad. People come here on F1 visas do tend to do extremely well than some of us who come here on a green card. And that's a fact. And the reason why mm -hmm. is because they are desperate. They know, like, man, if I don't do it, I'm on my way home. You know, mm -hmm. then they have to do their level best. It's not like most people come here on F1 visa are rich. No. Some of them are really inspired and desperate at the same time because they don't have the luxuries mm -hmm. most of us have. And I had to also mm -hmm. live in that kind of mindset, you know. If I sit and be, com be comfortable, being I can get a loan, I can buy a house, I can do whatever I want because I have a green card, now I'm a citizen, definitely I wouldn't have done it. Or if I would have right. been like, yeah, I want to go back to Kenya. It's been 14 years, mm -hmm. uh, you know. 
and most of us, truth be told, we are trying to bring our parents here, but I'm trying to invest to go back to Kenya. It doesn't make sense to me. So I had to have that kind of mindset. If I'm trying to bring my mom here and my kids here to try and be where I am, why am I so desperate to go back to where I'm bringing the rest of the people from? So, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. And another thing is also, I... don't, people are going to count you out. People counted me out. I'll tell you that. We don't have enough time for us to talk. Otherwise, we'll talk until tomorrow. The biggest thing is when you look in your mirror, don't count yourself out. Have the mindset. I have a D plus in car class, which I did. But you know what? I'm desperate enough to let those obstacles that are making me get D pluses out of my way. I got fired mm. from one job as a nursing assistant for sleeping at night. That became a miracle. I was able to spend time studying the, the time I was working. That's how I was able to pull up my grades and my GPA mm. to be able to do whatever mm. I was able to do. Wow, that is awesome. Thank you so much, Nathan, for coming. Um, my last question is, would you be willing to mentor uh, any of the viewers of our kids who would be willing to do from D? Would they be able to reach out to you? Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's okay with me. And I, I already do. Uh, like right now, I'm signed with uh, big brothers and big sisters. I have a, I'm a biggie, so I do mentor a few kids who you are assigned through the year and a half uh, and my church where i go to they have also youth programs from the community where i do speak like i'm scheduled to go there this week next week on uh, on wednesday uh, to speak and also encourage other kids who also are giving up uh, on this journey of life to try and encourage them mm -hmm. and I, I tell people you know when i watch other people especially the rich people they go back to listen to other successful people who have made it you listen mm -hmm. people like uh, lisa nichols those who know him you know right. uh, less uh, less brown mm -hmm. and all that and you mm -hmm. wonder why is, why is somebody who already a millionaire going to listen to another millionaire it's the same reason i'm here you guys who are watching me are going to be watching these videos it's people like us who have gone through your background it doesn't mean that mine is unique than yours you may have gone through worse but if you right. listen to me, don't have cynical. Don't be so cynical. Be like, oh, man, you know what? We've gone through the worst thing that you have gone through. This is how we inspire each other. And that's what the platform I use. Because mm -hmm. people may never get to read my book, but they can listen to my story at this time when I'm able to, to share Absolutely. It. And then there is Dr. Nathan Okioga Inspiration. Do you want to mention about that? Or is that like a private uh, endeavor? You know, it's, it's, it's not a private endeavor. It's in the works because of content and you know managing uh, being a married person having kids you know and you know a with my wife is being a big career which you have to work a lot which is very stressful and trying to mm -hmm. make up for the time that i lost uh, for my kids and my wife when i was in school uh, mm -hmm. I, it's, but it's in the works so but one of the things i want to get out of first of all is the book which I, i'm finishing up okay. so that's the one i want to get off and then i will go ahead and uh, get the website and you know that's why you need to help me you could have known by now right because yeah. you're one of the people who's helping me come up with that so yeah we're, we're still working on that and once it's formed you'll be more than happy yes yeah. once it's out i would be glad to share it and um yeah we, we can come back and let people know where to find it and how to order and then we can buy and read more okay? correct yes Right. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming tonight. There's a lot of uh, comments I see there. Uh, so encouraging. Thanks for sharing your story. That is Nancy Kanina. We have a lot of people mentioning you. And I would like for you to go read them and then you can get back to them. Otherwise, I really appreciate you showing up tonight. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for what you're doing. And whoever is watching, please always tune in to Gina. She does bring a lot of people with different backgrounds, different careers. And you never know which one it is. And uh, guys, we light one candle at a time. And there's no one, no one candle that has ever gone dim for lighting another candle. If I light your candle today, do the same thing. Light the other candle. And before you know it, it will be bright in the whole room. That is all that um, I can, my parting shot with you guys. And you are one of those people who is lighting the candles. You light one at a time and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me and, you know, thumbs up. Keep on doing what you're doing, Dina. Thank you so much, Nathan. Say hi to your family so much for me. I will, I will. <laughs> I know they are waiting for me to finish so they can be asking me questions on what's going on. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.
Thank you and have a good night. Thank you, my audience. Thank you for showing up and showing love to Nathan. Uh, continue encouraging because he will see and he will read these comments. It's really good to see when someone is willing to open up their lives to us. We need to appreciate, encourage them because they are doing that to encourage us as well. So thank you guys for tonight. Until next week, have a blessed weekend. Thank you so much.